in the current situation we find ourselves in, everybody's working from home, and I just wanted to show off the features that Synology has baked into their NAS units because these are quiet, these belong in every small office, and every home office they can play different roles. Now here at level one, we have a ridiculous insane storage server, but that doesn't mean that I still can't run some applications in the Linuxy underbelly goodness of this Synology. It's just point and click. In case you didn't know, the cloud is other people's computers. What most people don't understand about Amazon is that it's five nines of reliability overall. It's not necessarily five nines for you, the customer. Your stuff could be horribly broken and terrible and everybody else's stuff can be fine. And that's still five nines. It doesn't count that, you know, Amazon's not saying your stuff is gonna experience five nines of uptime. They're just saying that their infrastructure in general will experience five nines of uptime. Now you might be thinking, well, you've covered active backup in the past, like Synology active backup for business and some of the other utilities that are just point and click install on Synology. If I have a remote workforce and we're using Drive, can we also use some of the other Synology features to back up my entire remote workforce computers to the Synology? Yes, yes, you absolutely can. So that was actually not the cloud. That was powered by this thing. This is the Synology DS920 Plus. Now, in case it's not clear, what we were doing here with this shared office document was my intern and I were sort of sending little notes to one another back and forth in real time. That's part of the feature of Synology Office. When you're using Synology Drive, yeah, it's a drive storage thing, but the hosting software that's actually running on your NAS has the ability to actually open the files in the browser. Now, of course, if you have other devices hooked up to Drive, like I've got my Linux machine here hooked up to Drive, you can open them natively in LibreOffice, but you can also convert them and actually open them online and have that real-time collaboration, just like G Suite. Now, if you are an Office 365 user or a G Suite user, you don't have to go all in. Even though I had the same functionality or very similar basic functionality as G Suite, you know, document sharing. I'm editing a document and somebody else is editing a document at the same time and we can send comments to each other and do all the office sharing stuff. Uh, you can mix and match, actually run Office 365 or your Google G Suite and back it all up to here automatically. This thing can connect to your G Suite or your Office 365 and pull it down. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, 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 enough jibber jabbering. Let's just see how to install that. Well, first you go to the software center, you point and click. You want to install Drive, and you want to install Office. That's it. It'll go through, go through some configuration, go through some wizards. You're good to go. Have you forgotten what your Synology's IP address is on the network? No problem. Just go to find.synology.com. Because of some browser security and some other stuff like that, it'll actually take you to quickconnect.io. Quickconnect.io is a sort of a little sandbox that will let uh, the browser scan your local network but because it is sandboxed, it won't let whatever it finds on your local network scan be reported to the cloud or the internet because spying and stuff, which is a feature I can appreciate. So if it's just that easy, two clicks, two installs, this video could have been 30 seconds long. There's gotta be a catch. What's the catch? Well, with Google Drive, they actually do back up your stuff and provide some version control and some ability to recover in the event of an outage or some other problem. And that's the only thing that we haven't really talked about. The way that I'm accomplishing that is I've got another one of these units in the basement of my house and setting up this thing to replicate to the one at my house is pretty easy. Because of the way snapshots work and because of the way passwords and the controls and stuff like that work, I've got this thing replicating to the other Synology. And so let's say ransomware happens. Ransomware is gonna encrypt all the files. And let's say my drives are almost full. 10 terabyte drives, but I've only got two terabytes of free space. The ransomware is gonna go through here. It's encrypting all the files. It got started at five o'clock on a Friday. Nobody's gonna touch this over the weekend because you know we're, we're party animals around here. Ow, that was my knuckles. Nobody's gonna touch this over the weekend because you know of course we're 
party animals. We're not super nerds. We're going to roll in Monday, double click on a file. And it's like, oh, your files have been encrypted, blah, blah, blah. This thing will have replicated to the one offsite. An offsite replica is not necessarily a backup, but the way that I've configured my offsite replica, it actually has uh, snapshots and the snapshots are configured to be more important. So as it was getting the replicated data, it didn't really have enough space to hold the encrypted data, you know, because I only had two terabytes of free space, plus my replicas, but I've got my replicas set up to be important. So that thing just stopped accepting changes from this thing and sent me an email. And if I'd been paying attention to my email over the weekend, then I would know, hey, uh, there's something very wrong because many terabytes of information have changed on the NAS. Now, one thing that I will caution you on, if you are going to open up your NAS to the internet, you're gonna forward a port or allow inbound HTTP connections or allow inbound drive connections, you're not gonna use a VPN, you absolutely must keep the operating system that's the Synology firmware, that's the Linux underbelly. You must keep that up to date and you must update it regularly. You can set it to auto update, but that's something you should still check on at least once a month as the system administrator. You also should update the applications. They can, you know, update separately. If you are using something like Docker, you know, you're sort of venturing outside the point and click installation that Synology offers, you're gonna have to update those Docker containers from time to time too. It's not, super common that there's a privilege escalation out of Docker into something more severe. Docker is definitely the safer way to run these kinds of services, especially when you're sort of coloring outside the lines. We did the, the pie hole video where we talk about doing ad filtering on your Synology, which works really well. Um, we, Steam cache on your Synology, that also works really well. Uh, doing those kinds of things, a little outside the Synology use case, but that Linux underbelly, it does a really good job. So if you wanna do those kinds of things, you definitely need to keep up with your updates as long as it's on the internet. But other than that, you can pretty much go hog wild and be reasonably safe and have a pretty awesome point and click experience. Now, yes, yes, you can DIY this. You can absolutely DIY the office sharing and everything else. But in terms of maintaining that system, doing the updates, making sure the software is up to date and making sure everything works, it's gonna be a little bit more headache and a little bit more uptime than a point and click interface. Most NAS appliances, the companies behind them do actually put work into maintaining their software base and doing testing. And Synology is no different. And in the event that something does go wrong, you've got the option of setting up more than one Synology. Just buy another Synology, set up snapshots and replication. You can browse files, you know, you can browse your backups. You can use a timeline and see where the file was at a point in time. Somebody might have corrupted the really important presentation and you don't notice for a couple of weeks. Well, you can roll back with Synology software and the point and click GUI and just use the timeline. It's really easy and you can just cherry pick that one file. You don't have to restore everything. If you've got replication and something terrible happens to this NAS, you can just spin everything up on the remote NAS or, you know, pull something down from Synology's cloud because we've covered that before and that it actually does work really well. So to recap, the things that you saw here that was basically seamless, we got Synology Drive. You can access a drive letter on your local PC as well as from the web and get to applications. All of your applications and files and crap like that can be stored on your Synology, your documents, anything that you need to keep. Any documents that are on your remote workforce's PCs they can be stored here or replicated from their PCs to here, that's Synology Drive. If you wanna do document sharing with real-time collaboration, that's Office. Office runs on top of Drive. So that gives you the functionality to open up, say, a Word document that somebody has uploaded or an Excel spreadsheet, or, well, let's just call it uh, word processing documents or spreadsheets, that kind of thing. The format does matter a little bit because this is open source tools that we're using to manipulate um, these file formats and so, it's sometimes not quite as fully functional as Microsoft Office or applications, but it can deal with basic files of those formats. You can do real-time collaboration, adding notes to one another and that kind of thing, which is pretty awesome. Most people don't realize that that kind of functionality exists in open source software and companies like Synology can leverage that in their products for a really seamless user experience. It's really awesome software, and the fact that Synology makes it so easy as you know, point and click is you can just pick this up as an appliance and sort of be off to the races. And you don't have to pay really high monthly fees. You just buy the hardware, hook it up on your internet connection, and you're good to go. Be sure to check out their Synology configurator because you, you can get 
you know, lower end Synology devices all the way up through multi-bay rack mount solutions for the enterprise. Just depends on what you want, but they've got the same Synology software stack. And, you know, of course the rack mount system is going to be able to handle a lot more Docker containers and a lot more files and a lot more throughput than, you know, old Bessie here. But I could put 40, 50 terabytes in here with redundancy, no problem. Caching, the whole nine yards. I mean, just a quiet cube. Anyway, thanks Synology for sending over the NAS unit and letting me play with the software. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. I'm Wendell. This is Level 1. I'm signing out. I'll catch you later. As a fun aside, if you haven't looked into how mechanical hard drives work, every time I think about the information density on mechanical hard drives, mechanical hard drives are basically Rube Goldberg machines of data storage. I mean, it's a spinning magnetic disk with a ceramic electromagnetic read-write head that's held above the magnetic disk by just infinitesimal distances by the Bernoulli effect and sometimes we have to use helium because air is too turbulent and the coils hit a certain spot and then we have heat, heat assisted magnetic recording which might use a laser to heat things up because a regular magnetic field won't take unless we have a strong magnetic field because of the the heat from the thing and we don't want to flip nearby bits so we can use a weaker magnetic field as long as it's hot so let's use a laser to do that because thermals and magnetics they overlap a little bit but not too much and then things get sort of crazy from a quantum mechanical tunneling standpoint and then oh we're going to uh you know make the the bits taller into the recording magnetic substrate and it's, they're basically Rube Goldberg machines of data storage. It's really just insane how mechanical hard drives work. And it always blows my mind whenever I can do something like 50 terabytes in a tiny cube.